So my name is Lori Leonard. I'm the Injury Prevention and Outreach Coordinator for Trauma Services at Altman Hospital. And our topic tonight is going to be how in the world do I stay on my feet? So we're going to be talking about false prevention. And really, the big thing that you need to remember when we talk about how to prevent a fall is really to self-examine the three H's in your life. So what we're gonna do is briefly go through those three H's. And what the H's stand for is your home, your health, and your habits. Because there's really not just one factor that puts you at risk for falling. Um, all of the, everybody falls, irregardless of age. But we do know that as we become older adults, we are at a higher risk for those falls. And we can't really point to just one thing or two things that contribute to that. So what we like to, to give you information about is let's look at those three H's because everybody lives in their home in a different manner. Everybody takes care of their health in a different manner. And we all have our own habits. Um, and as we age, our home, our health, and our habits all have one thing in common, and that is they change. But sometimes we are not as human beings, creatures of change. We don't really like change. So we, we don't take it as a conscious effort to examine our home, our health, and our habits. So that's kind of where the focus of our talk is going to be tonight. So just to give you a, some um, kind of trivial type of information, falls are the number one cause of injuries that lead to visits to emergency rooms, hospitalizations, and deaths for Ohioans that are, are 65 years of age and older. One in three Ohioans that are 65 and older living in our community fall each year. So a third of us are having a hard time staying on our feet. And three in five falls occur in the home. That's a pretty good percentage that occur in our own homes, which are supposed to be our safe areas. So my question to you is, are falls a normal part of aging? Can we prevent falls? Can they be prevented? Or is it that we just get up every morning and we roll the dice and pray for the best? So you formulate your answers to those questions and I'm gonna cheat and give you some answers. Falls are not a normal part of aging. They can be prevented. So we need to change our mindset a little bit because I think that it's a little bit of a myth that people just believe that the older I get, I'm just gonna be more prone to falling. Um, they, they are not a normal part of aging. Um, and by us talking about the three H's, I think that you'll be able to see how we can create it not being a normal thought process. So when we talk about falls, I think we need to look at what can cause falls, what can, can allow us to have a fall. And we can divide those into different categories. So there are environmental factors, there are tripping hazards. And a lot of times we find these not only in our own homes, but also in the environment. So when we're out in our community, um, you know, everybody tries to make public areas safe. But I would caution you, and especially this time of year, when we're trying to make the community area and public spaces safe, so we're sprinkling a lot of salt on the sidewalks, which if there's too much, it becomes a slippery hazard. Um, you will see big soaker type rugs in entrance ways. And if you're a, a person that utilizes an assistive device like a cane or a walker or a wheelchair, it creates an uneven surface. And a lot of times that uneven surface is unnoticed until we're in the heat of the moment trying to navigate through the doorway and we get a little bit tangled up. So our, our, our environmental factors for tripping hazards are there all the time. We just need to be more aware of those. Insufficient lighting. Um, lighting has come a very long way and we'll talk a little more about that throughout the, um, the lecture. 
unsafe stairs. Um, any of you that are living in your home and you have stairs, whether it be a stairs of three steps, six steps, 12 steps, do we have a, a handrail? Do we have a handrail on each side? And what is the lighting like on your stairs? Um, poor design and organization. So if the layout of the paths that we travel the most frequently are not designed correctly or organized, or maybe we have a lot of our important things hanging around in those pathways, um, that can, can lead to environmental hazards. Um, slippery, shiny floors. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever visited Altman, Altman's main campus hospital and come into their newest building, the Bedford building. And when you walk in, you will very quickly notice the shiny tile type floors. Um, those can become a slippery hazard. Now those, those tiles have special, I wish I could remember the name of, they have something special in them that make them anti-slippery, but your first thought when you come in and look at those shiny floors is, oh my goodness, I hope I don't have any snow or ice or rain on my, my shoes. And our pets, our furry friends, those can be an environmental hazard to us. And then we can look at our personal factors. What about our muscle strength and what about our balance? Um, those, as we, we become older, those become less. Um, so we have to make a conscious effort to work on those. And we'll talk a little more later on about that. Um, nutrition and hydration. We know that older adults don't have the same appetite that they had during their middle age years. And as we age, we actually lose that, that component of, wow, I feel really thirsty. So as an older adult, when you start to have that thought of, wow, I feel really thirsty, it's usually because you've already started to dehydrate. So we don't really have that urge for thirst as much as we used to. So another reason we need to make that conscious effort to stay hydrated. What about our vision and our hearing? Those things are huge personal factors that we tend to take for granted. Um, and a lot of times the changes that happen with our eyesight and our hearing are progressive changes. So they happen over a longer period of time versus a shorter period of time. Um, there was a research article I read um, a year or two ago that said that we actually can have hearing loss and it can take us up to about seven years before we really ourselves notice it and feel like, wow, I should go get my hearing check. So I was kind of astonished by that number because that's a long time, um, but it is just a gradual progression of our aging. Um, what about our judgment? You know, we live in this society where it's let's go as quick as we can, you know, fast, fast, let's biggie size, let's keep moving. So, you know, a lot of times we sometimes don't slow ourselves down. Sometimes we just make the judgment. Well, I'm just gonna go, I'm just going up those three steps or I'm just going into the other room. I'm just gonna grab this and go. Um, maybe those aren't the best judgment calls for our balance and our ability to stay on our feet. The big one is inactivity. You know, as we age and we get older, um, we're not as active as we are. You know, if we've, we've had the, the blessing of having a family and children and we've been busy during those years when we were raising our children and, and participating in all the activities that go along with that. And then as you become um, the empty nester, as they, they say, um, and your children go on and they're in their own homes and that, and you're not having to run to all those activities, you know, if we don't pick up a hobby or something that that takes up that time during our day, we can become very inactive quickly. The number one personal factor is that fear of falling. And that probably is the strongest personal factor when you talk about fall prevention, is it's that fear of falling. Um, and oh my goodness, how do I deal with that fear? And how do I conquer that fear? Because it's actually that fear that can cause us to fall more frequently. Then we have to look at medical factors. Um, you know, I would challenge each of you, look at the medications that you're on and do you understand any interactions that could happen between those medications? 
Um, if you take a look at any of the medications, whether it be over the counter or prescription medications, um, if you look at the side effects on those, um, you will probably find the word dizziness in early on in the side effects, like the top one to three, one to five side effects, you're gonna find dizziness in there. Um, and what about urinary incontinence? That's good old mother nature. We all have to urinate, but as we age, a lot of times we become incontinent of that urine. And that can create um, a slippery surface for us to walk on if we haven't quite made it as far as we need to. So acknowledging that those changes are happening um, and there are a lot of resources out there um, to make that situation safer for you. Osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. Anybody that lives in Ohio generally doesn't have a good vitamin D level. And we know that vitamin D is a very, very important mineral for the strength of our bones and the strength of our joints. Um, you know, we just don't get enough of that natural vitamin D that we get from the sunshine. Um, and then if we look at our diet, where we would get our other forms of vitamin D, like those green leafy vegetables, um, how many of us really enjoy those green leafy vegetables? Um, not everybody does. So, you know, when you look at your diet and you look at your environment, where you live and how much sunshine you're getting, um, if you're not on a vitamin D supplement, that can set you up a lot for osteoarthritis and osteoporosis. And then you always have to add in your good genetics. You know, if grandma had weak bones and your mom had weak bones, and now, you know, you have that genetic predisposition. If you have diabetes, there um, are some problems with if the diabetes is not managed properly where the blood sugar is too low, like hypoglycemia or too high hyperglycemia. Those can affect, you know, our strength and our balance. Um, and then if we add in neuropathy, which is where the nerves in our hands and our feet become affected. So it's not as easy to feel sure-footed if you have neuropathy, particularly in your legs or your feet, um, because it's difficult when you lose that sense of, of feeling. Um, and there are many other conditions. You know, if you've had a stroke or a mini stroke or Parkinson's, things like that will all affect your gait um, and your balance. So let's talk a little bit about those three H's and how do we prevent those? We're gonna talk about um, preventing falls in our home. I'm going to just throw out a lot of suggestions and my challenge to you would be to take this next weekend if you get a little free time and just go room to room in your home and just evaluate that. You know, are there things that could be looked at to make it safer for you? Um, you know, because there's things that we take for granted in our own homes um, and we, we don't consciously look at some of the things. Um, one of them would be um, looking at your floors. Are the walkways clear? Um, you know, are there rips, cracks, are rugs secured? You know, looking at what is actually on the floor. Um, I had this happen with my own mother um, when she came home from the hospital after a uh, back surgery. She loves her throw rugs, but she does not secure them down. So we had to go around room to room and decide, do we need this throw rug? Are we keeping this throw rug? And if we are, how are we securing it so that it doesn't become that tipping hazard? Um, take a look at your stairs. I talked about this a few minutes ago. You know, do, are there handrails on the stairs? Um, are they secure handrails? Is there a handrail on both sides of the stairs? Um, and then taking a look at any of the steps that maybe have been worn. Um, lighting, is there good lighting at the top of the stairs as well as the bottom of the stairs? Um, there are so many fabulous lighting options out there that do not require you to call an electrician and have them come in and do um, what can be a very costly electrical repair to get you more lighting. Um, lots of things out there simply just to go to like Home Depot or a Lowe's type store, a Menards type store, um, where you can get things that work off of solar. Um, you know, so when it's dark, the light automatically comes on. There are some that work by motion so that when you walk by them, they automatically come on. 
Um, some of these you can plug right into your existing electrical sockets. Others require a battery of some sort. Um, and they have come a long way with lighting in that they have transpired it into LED, which is super bright lighting. Um, so that can always be effective to help light up those stairs versus having an electrician come in and put in more electrical um, switches and outlets. In your kitchen, where are your frequently used items? Are they easy to reach? Or do you feel the need to get up on a step stool to reach those things? Um, and if you're using a step stool, does it have a handle on it? Um, you need to really kind of look at that because if you get up on that step stool and start to lose your balance, what do you have to grip onto? Bathrooms, look at the, um, it, is there a need for some handrails? Do we need some handrails or some grip bars um, by the tub or around the toilet? Um, is there non-slip mats in the shower or the bathtub? And then um, back to good lighting as well. And the bedroom, where, where are things located in the bedroom? Is it easy for you to get in and out of that bed? If you're using an assistive device, where is your assistive device? Or when you put yourself to bed, do you put your assistive device to bed where it's out of reach because you're going to just travel the furniture and hang on to it along the way as you make yourself into the bathroom in the middle of the night? Um, I would challenge you to really spend a lot of time in your bedroom and your bathroom and look at the path that you take to get from the bathroom to the bedroom and the bedroom to the bathroom. Um, what does the flooring look like? Are there throw rugs there? Is there good lighting? Or do we maybe need a little motion light there um, that you can you know, stick up against the door frame or against a wall? Um, there's lots of different ways to plug those in. Um, and then one other, other um, piece of information with that being said with the bedroom and the bathroom, if you wear eyeglasses, do you sleep with your eyeglasses on or do you take your eyeglasses off and put them on the nightstand? With that being said, then your vision is impaired, it's dark and you don't have good lighting. So you're really setting yourself up for high risk area of falls there. And I will tell you a lot of the falls that we see in the emergency room, this is where they happen in the bedrooms and the bathrooms. Um, a flashlight, how many of you got a flashlight or a light next to your bed so that if the power goes out or you feel like you need more light because you've taken your glasses off, do we have that? Are there um, electrical cords and appliance cords, are those out of, out of, out of walkway paths? Um, you know, we don't want you to be tucking those under throw rugs. Um, they really need to, to be out of that walkway or that path. Um, when you're in the kitchen, storing food, dishes, and cleaning supplies, things that you would commonly use on a regular basis, where are those located? Um, you know, we, I did this in my own parents' home um, when we made that transition of all of the kids being gone from the home now and not needing the same type of, of dishes and cleaning supplies and things like that as we needed before. Um, Adding colored strips to stairs for more visibility. Um, there is um, wonderful products out there in the um, home stores, the Home Depot and Lowe's and, and them that you can do. Um, we already talked about keeping those stairs. Um, one thing that a lot of people will do is trip up the stairs. So we want to make sure that that we're looking at what what does the edge of our stairs look like? Is it is it in disarray and it need a little repair? Um, we need to maybe mark those edges with bright colored paint, or they have some colored tapes you can put on there. Um, depending upon the design of your stairs, um, they do make what they call strip lighting now. Um, so I have seen some people even install that on the um, edge of their stairs if they have the appropriate way of putting that on there. Bathroom needs to be a fall free zone. There needs to be a non-slip mat or the non-slip non strips on the floor in your, shove or your, in, in your tub or your shower. 
um, especially at, at where the points where you get in the tub and out of the tub, are you finding it difficult to get that leg reached up and over the edge of that tub? I would, would challenge you that if, if you are noticing that, then there are grab bars that they make that don't require you to permanently affix them to your tub, um, that they can be moved to different entrance and exit points of where you get in and out of that tub. Um, and those can be put on as like a, a grab bar, a handlebar type of situation. Um, because when you start adding water into the mix and you start adding soap and shampoo into the mix, you are really setting up a slippery slippery hazard there. So, um, you know, a lot of people will just grab onto the wall of the shower or grab onto the towel rack. And those are really not stable places to be holding on. Um, a portable phone. How many of you are taking to have a portable phone or have the ability to be able to reach out to somebody if you would have them forbid fall in the bathroom area? Um, do you have one of the lifeline type buttons? Do you feel that you need a lifeline button? You know, these are all things to try to think of. Um, you know, they make a lot of the, the home landlines now can be portable. Um, with docking stations that you would charge those in um, as needed. You know, I would encourage you maybe start taking one of those into the bathroom, you know, because a lot of people that fall in the bathroom tend to remain on the ground until somebody can get to them to help them get up off of the ground. Um, and I will tell you, if you lay there for any period of time, um, you can become very, very sick. Um, actually to the point of requiring an intensive care unit admission um, to the hospital. And that's not necessarily because you had a horrific injury or broke your hip or anything like that. It's just what happens to our muscles when we lay too long. Um, it can really cause a lot of problems with what we call our vital organs. So our lungs and our kidneys and our brain. Um, so have a way to reach help if you need help, in the, especially in the bathroom. Pets, don't we all just love our pet? Um, this little dog in this picture, I like to reach out and grab his cheeks and just give him a good old squeeze. But, um, you know, pets, pets like, like to be loyal. They like to have fun. They like to be exercised and they get very excited, especially if you get visitors. Um, and, and I don't know that pets intentionally are going to get in the way of our feet, but they tend to do that. And we can very easily get tangled if they're on a leash. If they're not, they just very easily can make us become off balanced and then down we go. Um, if your pet is, is laying on the ground next to you and you go to get up out of your chair or the couch, don't step over your pet. Make them move if they're in your way. Um, because about the time they do that is when they realize, oh, you've gotten up, so I must need to get up too. Um, and then they get up and get your feet and your knees all tangled. Um, feed and water pets away from walkways and doorways. Um, and make sure that you're cleaning up any spilled food or water that they, they would uh, get on the floor. Let's talk a little bit about um, health and fall prevention, okay? Um, one of the things I wanna talk about is um, diet and hydration. When you um, are looking at products to buy, we really want to make sure that you're getting five grams or less of sugar and fat and five grams or more of fiber and protein. And the reason that is so important is because that will help keep your muscles and bones healthy. So we really need to take a look at that. Um, I would challenge you guys to um, go to your pantry and take a look at, at some of the, the uh, products that you have and see what the sugar content is. Um, marketing in the food industry is crazy. They will market things as being quote unquote healthy foods. And then when you really look at the label and read the label, they're really not as healthy as they're marketed to be. Choose foods that are high in calcium, vitamin D, and low in salt. 
um, that will keep you well hydrated and will keep your bones and muscles happy. Um, recommended servings. You know, the United States is one country in this entire world where obesity is a very, very serious problem. And a lot of times it has to do with what kind of foods we're eating, but more importantly, it has to, um, has to do with what our serving sizes are. Um, they're really, really out of proportion. Staying hydrated. Staying hydrated does a lot for you. It helps your blood pressure. It can help with any dizziness feelings. It can help with fatigue. It can help with confusion. Um, so making sure that you're staying hydrated. Um, I did see one thing very uniquely in one of my Matter of Balance classes. And this was probably about a year or two ago. I had a, a lady that came to the class and she brought a water bottle with her. And on one side of the water bottle, it started with the time of day that she routinely was up and out of bed and moving. And on the other side of the bottle, it ended with the time of day that she generally retired for the night um, and, and went to bed. And it was kind of um, like she blocked it off, like drew lines on it and put different times um, related to how many ounces were in that water bottle. And she had set herself, set herself a goal that every day she was going to make sure she got a certain amount of ounces of water. And that was her reminder that when she looked at that cup and it was noon and that water level had not come down to noon, maybe it was up at the 10 a.m. level, then she knew, oh my gosh, I need to drink some more water. Um, and that was one way she was able to keep herself on track with staying hydrated. Exercising, oh my gosh, the E word, nobody ever wants to hear about this, exercising, exercising. So I think because when we think about exercising, everybody thinks, oh my gosh, I have to join a program. Oh my gosh, I have to travel there. Oh my gosh, it has to be you know, aerobic type things. You have to get your heart rate up to a certain heart rate and then bring it down. That is not true. Um, you know, remember when I said inactivity is prevalent in our older population a lot of times. And what happens when we do that is that little saying, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. That is very, very true of your balance and your muscle strength. So there are a lot of easy exercises that you can do in your own home. It doesn't require you to wear spandex. It doesn't require you to go get different pieces of exercise equipment, and it doesn't in involve you having to join a program. Now, I will tell you that you know yourself best. So if you need the accountability that, yes, I need to join a class, or I need to be a member of Silver Sneakers, or whatever the case is, then by all means do that. Um, if, if you're one that's like, you know, I, I just don't wanna go outside there. I don't, you know, I don't wanna join a member here. And that's fine. There are things you can do in the home. Um, weight shifting is one that's very, very important. Um, and you do this when you're standing and you would just shift your weight to one side and hold your foot off of the floor that you do not have your weight on. And try to hold that for about 30 seconds at a time. Obviously, you have two feet, so you would need to do both sides. Um, I would encourage you to make sure that you have something um, in front of you that like, such as maybe a chair or a table that you could balance your hands on until, um, until you felt comfortable that you were not going to lose your balance. Um, standing, lifting one foot and bending at the knee and trying to hold that position for 30 seconds. There's another one called the heel toe walk where you place the heel of one foot directly in front of the other foot and try to take approximately 10 to 20 steps. Leg raises are another one. This is one that you do while you're sitting where you extend one leg in front of you, hold it for one second and return it to the bent position like you're sitting and then you do the other leg. Um, and then you would, would work up on those repetitions um, to increase that. Foot taps, stand, your feet at hip width, so you have a good a good base, a good a good uh, foundation. 
um, in front of a step and then slowly raise one foot up and tap it on the step in front of you and then place it back down on the floor. And then you would do the other foot the same. Um, I will tell you that if you can maintain the strength in particularly your thighs and your hips, your balance will be much better. Um, so by doing any type of a sitting exercise, a marching exercise, or there's one that is shown on the screen, it's called sit to stands, where you stand in front of a sturdy chair, you slowly lower your hips onto the chair, and then without moving your core, meaning not using those stomach muscles, you stand up. Um, and that's one that you'll really feel in your thigh muscles. And particularly if you live in an environment where you have a lot of stairs, that's very, very important because how many times do we get halfway up the stairs or halfway down the stairs and we have to stop and take a little breather and then go. Um, and that is a lot of times muscle fatigue, um, particularly in those thigh muscles. Mind over your medicines. So make sure that when you visit your, your family doctor that you're bringing a list of all of the medicines with you, okay? Um, look for those warning labels. And I will tell you most medications will have warning labels for dizziness or drowsiness. Um, and those are two big factors that can set us up for losing our balance, which will make us at risk for a fall. Take your medicines exactly as prescribed. Um, you know, don't, don't change your medication doses. If you're to be taking it every day or twice a day, make sure that you're taking it that way. If you have concerns about it, those are reasons that you need to reach out to your physician or your pharmacist um, and have those discussions. Um, talk about eating habits and your food intake and how that affects your medicines. There are a lot of medications that need to be taken with food there are a lot of medications that are not working properly because you're taking them with food and you should be taking them on an empty stomach. Um, one of the other things that I see the older folks doing is we're on medications and if they're to be taken twice a day, we take them all at one time in the morning and all at the same time in the evening. What you have to remember is each medication acts differently on your body. So there are some medications that are going to become at their peak effectiveness at a different time than another medication. So maybe they shouldn't be taken at the same time. And those are conversations that your pharmacist can help you um, regulate. But a lot of times we choose to go to the convenience route. Uh, I don't wanna to forget to take my medicine. So if I just take them all in the morning and then take them all again at dinner, I can check that off of my to-do list and I took my medicines the way I was supposed to. But they may be interacting with others. So you need to make sure that you've had that conversation with your pharmacist or your physician. Um, and then if you do have to change that up so that it's not as convenient to remember, um, and space that medication out, that somehow you're able to set up reminders for that. Whether you're setting an alarm to go off at a certain time of the day, um, or you're you know, putting a little note up somewhere, or using one of the um, pill dividers where you can divide out the medication. Um, when you're buying over-the-counter medications, make sure that they only have the ingredients in that you need. Um, and you will find this a lot in the cough, cold, and congestion medications. Those are what we call polypharmacy medicines, meaning they have more than one drug in them. So if you're going to the pharmacy with the intention of buying something because you have a runny nose, maybe you don't need the other medication in there that suppress a cough and control a headache. So you really need to take a look at that. And it's very confusing, very, very confusing. So don't hesitate to stop at your pharmacist, talk to him or her and find out, hey, I'd like to get something to help with the runny nose, but I don't wanna take other medicines that I really don't need in my system at this point. And they can help you um, figure out which one would be appropriate. When you see your primary care doctor, tell them if you've had any of these incidences in the past six months, any falls, slips, or trips. 
If you've started to notice some problems with walking or balance, or maybe some weakness or numbness in your legs or your feet. Maybe you've noticed some swelling in your ankles or your feet, some difficulty breathing, some shortness of breath, or you've noticed some dizziness or some feeling like I'm gonna pass out. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of different medical problems that can cause these. And there's also just simply, I'm not hydrated enough or I'm not eating the appropriate um, food that can cause some of these things. Changes in your hearing or your vision, any changes in your sleep pattern. Um, chronic conditions like diabetes, arthritis, and high blood pressure, and then any of the medications that we use to treat this can set us up for having some other feelings like my sleep pattern is not correct. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit dizzy or weak with this, or I feel like I want to sleep all the time. Um, and then don't forget about depression. You know, if we become inactive and we have that fear of falling, what do we tend to do? Not go anywhere, not do anything, right? So now we have socially isolated ourselves, you know, and you're going to hear a lot about that in relationship to depression and mental health because of the COVID situation and the pandemic that we're in. Um, there is a lot of that out there right now. So um, we really need to be having a discussion if you're really feeling down and sad um, with your physician so that they can give you some adequate resources for that. Pertaining particularly just to falls, five questions that you should have on your list to ask the doctor. Can you give me a referral to have my vision checked? Um, you know, people will go a long time without getting their vision checked regularly. And if you can get that vision checked regularly, a lot of times if you're starting to have some problems, maybe with cataracts or glaucoma, or one of those problems that we see in the older population, um, those can be caught early and treated um, and monitored. Um, are there any assistive devices that you think would be appropriate for me? Um, don't be afraid of assistive devices. <clears throat> They're there to help um, and keep you balanced. There are many, many different types, and that can be just as confusing of an aisle to go to as going to the pharmacy aisle to get something over the counter for a cough or cold. Ask the doctor, I'd like to, I'd like to stay physically active. What's appropriate for me? What's not appropriate for you? You know, if you suffer from some problems with diabetes, we know activity will increase your met metabolism and it may alter some of your blood sugar readings. So how do we do this and do it safely? Um, maybe we have some blood pressure issues or some cardiovascular or heart issues. Um, you know, there are some physical activities that may not be appropriate. So, you know, having that conversation with the doctor. Um, Asking the doctor, can you give me a referral for a home assessment to reduce my risk of falls at home? There are um, individuals out there that can come in and they can, can do a home assessment for you. If you go room to room yourself and you're like, I'm just not sh sure what I should do or, or what I should be looking at, there are, are professionals that would come in and would take a look and make some suggestions for you. Um, and then they would have the resources if you would choose to act on anything um, for instance, have grab bars installed in the bathroom area. Um, they would be able to get you hooked up with some resources there. Um, are there community resources or classes that can help reduce my risk for falling? Um, you know, a lot of times out in the community, there are some, some balance classes out there. There is some Tai Chi. There is um, some silver sneakers just to keep us active and, and walking. Um, and there are a lot of therapy programs as well. Um, so having those conversations with your physician will help open up the door to a lot of different resources that you may or may not be aware are there for you. So what about those good old habits that we all have? We need to try to examine those. And sometimes those really take a lot of conscious effort on our part because it's just the way we've always done things. But as we become that older adult, we need to really take a look at what those habits are. And can I change that a little bit 
to make it a little safer and decrease my fall risk. Moving slowly when you get out of bed or a chair. You know, sometimes we just, we get up real quick. Oh my gosh, the phone's ringing. Oh my gosh, somebody's at the door. And we come flying up. And then we're like, whoa, I'm a little bit woozy, dizzy feeling. You know, so, so making a conscious effort just to slow down a little bit and think about what my task at hand is. Checking curb heights before we are stepping up or stepping down, especially when we're out in our community. Um, you know, they do a lot with those trying to paint them yellow and paint them white and things like that. But a lot of times our visual perception can be off. So really checking out those curb heights before we, we make the determination of how far up we need to step or how far down we need to step. Watch for inclines on ramps. Um, sometimes, you know, that, that visual perception is not there as to actually how steep that ramp is. Keeping at least one hand free for balance while walking. I think that personally for me, that's a hard one, especially if I've been to the store and maybe I have four bags or something I want to carry in. Oh, I'll just I'll put two in one hand and two in the other and make one trip. Sometimes that's not the safest choice. So make sure you keep that one hand free for balance while walking. Don't try to multitask while you're walking or climbing upstairs. You know, how easy is it for us to grab that laundry and then, oh yeah, I'm gonna grab that bag of toiletry supplies to go up to the upstairs bathroom and we're trying to multitask. Or maybe we're gonna carry those things up the steps or down the steps and we're gonna have the phone propped on our ear. So really trying not to multitask while you're climbing. Wearing well-fitting shoes with non-skid soles at home. I'm very, 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 I'm guilty of this. I hate wearing shoes. I absolutely hate it. But I will tell you that I've had a lot of near falls because of the fact that I've had slippery socks on. You know, no intention of slipping on the stairs, but socks and carpeted stairs don't mix. So making sure that you have well-fitting shoes and non-skid um, soles on the bottom of those. Um, for those of you that like to be comfortable in your slippers, I would challenge you to flip them over and look at the bottom of them. Do they have a non-skid sole on them? Have you worn off the non-skid sole? Because you know you find that pair that you just love and you're very, very warm and fuzzy in it and it's hard to get rid of those, but they do wear out. So take a look at that. The other thing is for those of you that are driving, taking care of getting out and into your car. Um, you know, a lot of times we can get tripped up on that floorboard as we come through the door frame there, getting in and out of our car. Um, and I will tell you that there are um, triple A's that will do programs called Car Fit, um, where they will actually have you drive your car right on up there and they'll take a look at, at you sitting in that car. You know, do you have your seat appropriately where it needs to be? Or do you have the steering wheel an inch and a half from your chest wall? You're too close then. You know, can you, are your mirrors fitted correctly? They do make a product that does sit on the seat of your car and it, it has a swivel on it. So it actually helps swivel you so that your feet are, are coming to the outside of the car um, so that you're not trying to scoot through that seat. Um, so that is a resource that you can always use to take a look at your car habits and getting in and out of the car. Any of us that are using a cane, um, there's a lot of misconception about the proper way to use a cane. It needs to be properly fitted to your body. Um, the handle of the cane, cane should come to the crease in your wrist. Okay, so you should have a little crease there. Um, they say to talk to a mobility professional. Anybody that works in the therapy department can help you get fitted for a cane, okay? Um, a lot of times we won't have, maybe we feel we need an we, we have the need for a cane, we don't have one, but maybe our neighbor or our brother or our sister has one. And may, or maybe we have one that's just been passed down through the family. And that's great to use it, but it needs to fit you appropriately. So if you're five, six, and the person that used it before you was six, four, that cane's not gonna be fitted appropriately to you. The other thing is to look at the rubber tip on it. You know, does it have wear through it? Is it the rubber tip that I need on my cane? 
You know, when we think standardly of a cane, we think about just the, uh, the single rubber tip, but they do make ones that do have um, a quad cane, if you will, meaning that it's a wider based rubber tip that goes on there. Um, you're gonna use your cane on the weaker side of your body so that the cane and the weaker side of your foot or leg should hit the ground at the same time. Other things that we can do to be safe on our feet and to make sure that we can get out into the community is to exercise regularly to maintain that flexibility and strength. Um, I, I will tell you this is, is very, very important. And this, this can be a matter of just doing exercises during commercial breaks of your favorite show. Um, if you're one of those people that have to get up in the morning, get ready for the day, get my exercising done and move on with my day, then that, that's appropriate too. It's all in how it fits in your lifestyle because everybody's lifestyle is a little bit different. It doesn't involve that you have to dedicate an hour or two each day to nothing but strictly exercising. You know, if it's just a matter of we've gotten this nice icy snow this evening and tomorrow I was going to go take the dog for a walk around the park and see some of the Christmas lights in the park. And now you're not going to do that because you, you don't want to be exposed to those elements and risk the fall then that means we don't get up and walk. That means that maybe you just need to make some laps through the house with the dog, um, different things like that. So you just taking a different mindset as to how regularly we can fit that exercise in. Um, if you suffer from chronic pain, you know, please have a discussion with your physician about that. Um, a lot of times chronic pain can be exacerbated by lack of movement. So it's one of those double-edged sword type of things where it kind of hurts to move, but if I rest too much, it hurts to move as well. So you have to find the, the, the balance there. Um, getting rest during the night can be difficult. And I would, would encourage you, if you're going to have a discussion with your physician about not sleeping properly at night, please make sure that you're honest with them on any over-the-counter medications that you're using as well as having an updated medication list with you, because it may be something just as simple as retiming a certain medication. The common one that, that we see are people that are on a water pill. If you take that water pill too late in the day, you're gonna be up all night visiting the restroom. So you know, just retiming that sometimes can, can provide you with a little bit more of a restful evening. Um, a yearly eye exam, getting your glasses updated, having that hearing checked. And then if you're feeling a little bit uneasy about the driving um, in your car, and this can be a very sensitive area because driving is very much associated with us staying independent. And a lot of times we don't wanna even bring up that subject because I don't want anybody taking my keys, right? Because we have that sense that we're gonna lose our independence. It's really not a, a matter of losing our independence, but there are some adult driver classes out there um, that they will teach you different ways of looking at things. I mean, I don't know about you, but the way the roads were set up and the signage and roundabouts and all of those other things um, that are out there now, those things, some of those things did not used to be there years ago. So, you know, just understanding how those work and how to be safe with it um, would be a great resource. Um, we certainly don't want you to choose to put yourself at personal risk and just wing it. So my challenge to you is to identify those personal risk factors. You know, is it that I really need to concentrate on, on one of the three H's? And whether that be, I, I really need to kind of look at things in my home. I think I could make it safer. Or maybe it's your health. You know, maybe you have a lot of questions about your medications and, and things like that. Um, and maybe it's those habits that it's just the way that we have always done something. Um, maybe that, that way that we've done it needs to be re-examined. Okay, so I would really, really like you to challenge yourself and become self-aware of that. Know your environment. 
what what are you noticing a theme wow the lighting in my house is really bad or, you know my lighting's pretty good but i could probably clean up a little bit you know or maybe i have a lot of uneven surfaces that need to be taken a look at how many of you have the refrigerator with the ice maker in it and when you you put it under there and you intend to get half a glass of ice and all of a sudden you have a full glass of ice that has spilled over everywhere and all those ice cubes are sliding around your kitchen floor and let me tell you, they slide into inconspicuous spaces that sometimes we don't see, and then they melt, and then they become that water spill, and then they put us at risk of um, stepping in that and having a fall. So make a plan for fall prevention. Take action. There are so many resources out there, um, and that sometimes it's very difficult to know what those resources are or where to seek those resources. I would encourage you, your primary care and your pharmacist would be a great spot to start. 